Namaskar, hello, Anyum Haseo, and a very warm welcome to all the esteemed dignitaries and the online audience for the inaugural event of Distinguished Indian Heroes of Science and Technology brought to you by Indian students and researchers in Korea and hosted by Merck Life Sciences. I would like to start this meeting by extending my personal best to you and your families in terms of health and well-being by reciting a shloka. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramaya, sarve bhadrani pashyantu, ma kaschit dukh bhag bhavet. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti hi. May all be happy, may all be free from illness, may all experience the auspicious, may no one be overtaken by suffering. These are trying times around the globe, especially in India. But as the adage goes, the show must go on and that is what we will do today. I am Apurva Kulkarni, a representative of Indian students and researchers in Korea, and I'm super excited to be your host today. Indian students and researchers in Korea, popularly, popularly known as ISRK, is a non-profit organization in South Korea that aims to connect all the Indian origin students and researchers residing in South Korea and provide them with educational, research, social, recreational, job, and community support. Since its, since its launch in 2019, ISRK has conducted several webinars outlining the scholarship opportunities and has helped several people secure jobs in South Korea. By distributing safety kits to students and researchers in South Korea, ISRK has done its bit during the harrowing COVID times. ISRK enthusiastically promotes Indian culture by collaborating with organizations such as Swami Vivekanand Culture Center and Spikmake. So far, 3,000 students and researchers are associated with ISRK and we aim to grow this family manifold in coming times. 75 weeks from India's 75th Independence Day, Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji, in his speech at the launch of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, said, Five pillars will inspire the dreams and duties of independent India. These pillars are freedom struggle, ideas at 75, achievements at 75, actions at 75, and results at 75. Inspired by this, we the team of ISRK in a 75 we the team of ISRK bring to you achievements and contributions of Indian scientists during the last 75 years in a 75 week long program to be known as Distinguished Indian Heroes of Science and Technology. We believe this will inspire many of us to carry on the supreme legacy of Indian scientists while also publicizing science and technology. Before we formally begin this program, I would like to mention that there is a 15 minutes Q&A session at the end of the program and we all and you all can type your questions to the dignitaries in the Q&A box on your window. And now, without further ado, I would like to first invite the go-to man of ISRK, Dr. Vibhu Jain, Chairman of the ISRK Advisory Committee and APAC Marketing Leader for Merck Life Sciences to come forward and begin the session. Over to you, Vibhu. Uh, thank you, Apurva, for kind introduction. Her Excellency, uh, Sri P. R. Rangnathan, Indian Ambassador of Republic of Korea, Professor N. K. Ganguly. Professor Jerome Kim, Professor Harish Pat, ISRK members and volunteers, as well as distinguished guests who are able to join us today in this session. My name is Dr. Vibhu Jain. I am Head of Marketing and Strategy for Asia, for Merck, and member of Advisory Board of ISRK. A couple of months ago, my eight-year-old daughter asked me that, who people will remember for long? mom or you? I was like surprised that how can she ask this kind of question? Who will, who people will remember for long? But answer was prompt. Of course, your mom, she is a scientist. And her work is more relevant to the world than me. I decided after my PhD that I will go for a business uh, route, not doing science. 
and uh, I did my PhD from Imtech Chandigarh. Dr. Ganguly at that time was advisor, uh, chairman of research advisory council. So a uh, lot of guidance we got as students from him during our PhD. And uh, my boss always used to tell that whatever you do, ensure there is a science within you. And that's the reason I felt that I need to connect with Indian students and researchers in Korea. There is more than 5,000 plus researchers, PhD students and postdocs in Korea. And uh, I started connecting with the community and uh, trying to support that. When we come to the topic for the day, Indian researchers has contributed a lot for our country. Sir C. V. Raman, Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam, Professor C. N. R. Rao, M. Vishweshwarya, Chidambram Subramanian. These are some of the Bharat Ratan awardees, and we all know their contribution to science. But then there are several other great scientists from the country, and their contribution might not be known to every one of us. It might be known just to the scientific community across the globe. Distinguished Indian heroes of science and technology is ISRK effort to make our current generation and new generation know about the contribution of these heroes of India. We are pleased to bring this initiative as part of India at 75 celebration by Indian government and Indian embassy in South Korea. Through this initiative, in next several weeks, ISRK team will bring infographics, video stories, and webinar sessions talking about Indian origin Nobel laureates, Bharat Ratna Awardee, Padam Vibhushan, and Padam Bhushan Awardees. Today, we are having Professor N.K. Ganguly as a guest of honor with us. Um, not only his work, but the work with where he contributed to most of us as researchers in infectious biology, in, um, in immunology, in cell biology, is uh, something which we will not forget as students. And I am sure when we will be talking to him, he will be sharing a lot of insights with us. Every time I talk to volunteers from ISRK, they inspire me with their energy motivation and commitment for contribution to our society. With this, I would like to open the session and would like to thank every one of you to be part of this inaugural event. And thanks for giving me um, this honor, uh, Purva and the team, that I can speak uh, in front of all the distinguished guests. Over to you, Apurva. Thank you, Dr. Jain, for your opening remarks, your kind words, and also for your valuable suggestions for, for ISRK. The chief guest of today's event needs no special introduction at all. Be it a COVID crisis or a cultural event, she leaves no stone unturned to be there for her citizens. She believes in India before anything else. She is a strong supporter and encourager for ISRK. Dear all, Please join me in welcoming the chief guest of today's event, Indian Ambassador to Republic of Korea, Ms. Sri Priya Ranganathan. Ma'am, we know how busy you are and we are extremely grateful to you that you could take out your time and spend an evening with us. The space is all yours. Thank you so much, Apurva, for an exceedingly generous introduction. I think this is... Uh... Uh, I feel a little uh, intimidated by the kind of people who are there in the room today and I think you have been extraordinarily kind. But let me begin by first uh, recognizing the presence of uh, Padmabhushan uh, Professor Ganguly, uh, former DG of the ICMR. Uh, I think Dr. Jerome Kim is supposed to be there, my good friend, the DG of the International Vaccine Institute, though I don't see him on screen at the moment. Professor Harish Pad, who I have never had the privilege of meeting, but uh, I have heard about you. Uh, and of course, Dr. Lailesh Kumar, who is the, the president of the Indian students and researchers of, uh, of Korea, who is really the, the brain behind this, uh, this event that we are all part of today. And of course, all our friends from uh, India and from Korea alike. It is truly a great pleasure to be part of this uh, very unusual event that we have, a uh, series of events that has been launched by the ISRK. 
to recognize and uh, and uh, applaud the uh, the contributions of distinguished indian scientists across the ages um i think it is particularly uh, timely that this event should come uh, just as we begin our celebrations of uh, india at 75 as all the indians in the audience will know we are uh, we are we began our journey as a nation uh, just under 75 years ago and we are uh, looking forward to our uh, uh, to our 75th birthday if you will on the 15th of august 2022 and what we have tried to do at the embassy and i think this is a, a kind of a, a all of government enterprise and all across the world indian missions are doing this we are trying to mark this uh, this milestone with uh, uh, with some sort of activity some sort of uh, uh, events that highlight some element of what we have uh, what we have achieved in these 75 years and we started this process 75 weeks before the 15th of august 2022 so we began on the 15th of march so i think this uh, this this uh, initiative has come at a brilliant time in terms of uh, what we are uh, what we are trying to celebrate and what we are trying to applaud again it bears no uh, repeating that the kind of uh, rigor and the kind of depth of scientific inquiry in india has been very very long lasting and uh, we all take pride in the fact that uh, uh, the zero was uh, discovered or invented if you will in india that the uh, that the wheel was uh, invented in india we have the great works of uh, of uh, sushruta and uh, and uh, aryabhata and uh, patanjali to guide us in terms of our uh, 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 what we have inherited from our uh, from our ancestors and in modern india too we have made some significant strides in uh, scientific exploration and discovery um and i think uh, uh, we would not be here today as a nation that we are if our uh, if uh, over these 75 years our uh, our leaders had not given the kind of importance to science and uh, and uh, uh, scientific education as they did and um, uh, what we have today as witness to that is the fine institutions that have been created the indian institutes of technology the indian institute of science which is uh, one of the most iconic uh, educational institutions in uh, in uh, in science in the country and abroad i would say uh, more recently the indian institutes of information technology um, uh, the kind of uh, uh, fantastic uh, uh you know uh, research institutions that have been created whether it is isro whether it is csir uh, whether it is the 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 organizations that work with the department of biotechnology i think all of these institutions have really served us very well over these uh, over these past uh, several decades and we have the we have to our credit uh, uh scientists like uh, uh in all possible fields whether it is uh, uh swaminathan dr swaminathan in the field of uh, who gave us the green revolution whether it is dr kurian who gave us the white revolution uh dr uh, abdul kalam who of course was the uh, was not only a, a great scientist but also our very very beloved president i mean we, we can just go on and on and on and i guess that is the entire purpose of the series which uh, the isrk has launched that not only should those of us who are in india know and appreciate these uh, these uh, greats who have gone before us but that the more current generation in india and abroad should remember them and recognize them for what they are i should also say since i am the indian ambassador in korea i have to talk about the india korea connect i think it is a it is what what we have is a great asset in that the uh, the researchers community the indian researchers community here is so strong it was a discovery for me when i came here that we have a uh, about 8000 strong student community of which there is a large chunk which is in the in the field of uh, uh, with the various kinds of sciences um it would be it has been uh, i've made a very 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 small effort at the embassy to try and connect with as many of them as possible this has not been very successful in the past year or so because of the covid restrictions which has meant that we have not been able to meet in person but uh, certainly the thought process is very much there and uh, we have we did have the opportunity last year or early this year when uh, when prime minister had an inter had a interaction with uh, 
uh, Indian uh, and Indian origin scientists around the world to be able to have two of our scientists right here in Korea join him at that table. And we are very proud that we were able to highlight the India-Korea connection in that manner. Uh, I also hope that not as part of this event, but as a, as a larger India-Korea connection, that we are able to build on some of these uh, very strong, this very strong foundation that has been created and that Indian scientists who, and researchers who are working here in Korea will go back to India, will be able to contribute, will be able to take the learnings from Korea into the organizations that they work for in India and vice versa, that there are uh, people in India who are currently working at you know, such organizations who come to Korea who are able to share some of what they have learned, what they have researched, what they have discovered. There is, I find, a great deal of respect in Korea for uh, Indian, uh, the scientific temper and, uh, and, uh, and the kind of uh, commitment and, uh, and the sheer intelligence of our people. So this is something which makes me very proud. So that is, uh, that is really all that I have to say from my side. But I thank you so much for inviting me and for, uh, for allowing me to share my thoughts. And I look forward greatly to not only this, uh, this uh, to our discussions today, but all those to follow. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing your thoughts. One thing that really stood out from your talk was you encouraging the Indian students here to learn as much as possible from Korea and go back and serve India. We, we, we truly hope that happens. And we again, once again, thank, thank you for graciously accepting our invite. We also deeply appreciate your support to science and technology and to our event. Moving on, Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel had said, there is something unique in the soil, which despite many obstacles has always remained the abode of great souls. We would now like to play the visuals of one such great soul the first Asian to win Nobel Prize in science and whose work has been influential in the growth of science in India. Nobel laureate Professor Chandra Shekhar Venkat Raman. Can you please play the visuals now?
Wow, truly inspirational. After seeing this, I'm reminded of a statement I read somewhere. Great men never die, they just disappear. They are always present amongst us in the form of their teachings, their ideas. I really realize how true is the statement now. Next, I consider my absolute privilege to invite on this virtual stage Padma Bhushan awardee, Professor Nirmal K. Ganguly. Like our chief guest, Professor Ganguly also requires hardly any introduction. A leading biotechnologist, immunologist, and a former director general of Indian Council of Medical Research, Professor Ganguly was honored with India's third highest civilian award, Padma Bhushan, in 2008 for his work in the field of medicine. He currently serves as an advisor to Translational Health and Health Science and Technology Institute India and is also a member of the advisory group for the International Vaccine Institute South Korea. With no further ado, I give you all the Padma Bhushan awardee, Professor N.K. Ganguly. Thank you, Apurva, and thank you, Lailesh Kakarish, as well as Bibu Bibu and uh, Honorable Sipya Ranganathan, the Ambassador of India to South Korea, and all the other participants on this event. India is a large country of 1.3 billion people, and uh, it's a country which is uh, striving to be world's uh, one of the major economies. It is actually one of the major economies with a tremendous potential to lead the world in the future. However, it has, uh, it, it, there are two Indias, and rather, rather there are three Indias. The South India, which is more prosperous, more developed, more forward-looking and moving, and North India, which is uh, struggling to find its feet and, uh, and uh, has a lot of uh, disparities in the very different kind of people at the different ranks. In between, the India has got 330 million people, like the same same as of uh, population as America, who can afford anything in the world. When they can uh, afford treatment, they can afford travel, they can afford education. They, at the largest number of billionaires are in India. But then India has around seven to eight hundred uh, million population who has nothing. They are the disadvantage. There are distant populations of the tribal populations. There are populations in the urban slums, which are uh, which are India's poorest of poor, as well as those who are homeless, street uh, dwellers, as well as uh, those who. Uh, are migrant laborers who move from one place to another. So these are the deprived, and India has to look after them. It has done a lot of things for them to lift them up, and it has been able to lift them up to a certain extent. But these calamities like, uh, like uh, the corona uh, the pushes us down again in those efforts. So. Uh, when I was a DGI seminar, almost every year I fought a pandemic, whether it was H5N1, which was H1N1, whether, whether it was Congo hemorrhagic or, or Japanese B encephalitis, dengue, chicken, munia, you just name it, Chandipura virus, you just name it and we have, have we had it. And this was really very, 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 uh, uh, Problematic. We also had SARS when it hit cold South Korea, the first SARS, 2002-2003 SARS. But some or other, we were able to manage it. We could create our own diagnostics through our public health measures. We were able to contain many of them. And many of them lingered on or became endemic, but more or less we were able to handle them. This time, this virus was uh, something with which we are, we are still struggling. This virus actually originated from China, as we know. There are different theories uh, that uh, it was an escape from 
of the Wuhan lab where the research was going on for the bat viruses. Uh, there are some suspicion that some performance enhancement happened in this and this performance enhancement happened in the form of a, a furan area which can integrate into the cell and enter into the cell much more efficiently. And also there were some changes which happened in the receptor binding domain which made it more transmissible to human. Because for every other uh, bat virus, we had something like the last SARS, we had, uh, we went, it went from bat to civet cat and to human. This also we had in pangolin, but this virus we had in pangolin, but there is no intermediate between the, between the bat and the, hum, and the human. It looked like that it got, uh, it infected some scientists in the Wuhan lab and these scientists fell sick and they, and they were hospitalized. At that time, the nature of the virus was not known. By the time it, it, it must have known, it must have passed to other persons also. So this is now being investigated, the origin of the virus. The, the China did very well and uh, it, uh, the main virus clade was L clade. And it uh, really clamped up a tremendous lockdown in, in uh, Wuhan area. Nothing entered, nothing went out. This is one of the major uh, effort in uh, having a, a low hazard index. So that particular part, uh, they were successful and L clade almost disappeared. In South Korea, it's like other places, another clade evolved that was the S clade. And this clade was also some or other handled by South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore and others very effectively by, by simple measure of doing quick diagnostics, tracking, tracing, as, as well as uh, containing those who were aff aff affected thereby preventing the transmission. So these countries did very well. They did much better even before the vaccine was um, available. And, um, and their economy didn't suffer that much. Then there were Europe and the United States. They couldn't really, uh, they didn't really cram down on the travel and other places and the kind of lockdown which happened in China could not be affected in these countries. They had a really bad time, huge amount of deaths, about, about uh, millions of millions of deaths happened in these two uh, major, uh, major areas of Europe, uh, European economy, UK and United States. And the virus evolved into the, the DG form, the D form, and then it evolved into G clade. And from the G clade, GV and GR, these happened because the hazard index was high. People were tra traveling from one place to another and, and the virus went on evolving. And India caught it in between and uh, it caught, uh, the, the virus got into DV and DR form. Then some special mutation, mutations occurred. One of the famous mutation is British mutation, which is now known as alpha B17.1.7. And this, this went to United States. This was much more transmissible, carried havoc in both Europe and United States. The South African state B1.1315 was again a very transmissible, much more difficult virus than than the uh, the British UK variant and then the Brazilian variant which is known as P1 and P2 uh, these were also difficult variants but some or other they didn't spread that much around the world they remained in their own continent and own sphere so the Brazilian variant spread in the South America the South African variant spread in uh, Africa but some or other they didn't, uh, they came to India, everything comes to India. Indians travel 
um, all around the world and uh, others travel to India. So they, uh, they uh, get into this, but the one of the major problem happened, a very bad mutation in India. That was 1.617. And uh, this was, uh, uh, this went into two more variants, 1.617. Uh, point, uh, 0.2 and 617.3. 0.2 became the other mutations. Some mutations die by themselves. They can't establish themselves. Some mutations establish because of the circumstances. And the other mutations, they, um, they are nasty mutations and they are able to spread and they are able to change the course of the disease. So this Indian mutation now, which is known as uh, Delta, which was named as Delta and now is known as Delta Plus, is something which is now globally people are fearing. Uh, Six percent of all infection in United States is because of this now, as well as the UK, which has controlled quite nicely again and small surges being seen, seen because of this mutation. This mutation is less amenable to the uh, monoclonal antibodies made by Regeneron and Eli Lilly and uh, maybe less uh, handleable with the uh, available vaccines. So, so this is something which is at the moment people are debating that whether this will cause another third surge or not. So India, when it uh, got the first infection in Kerala and it started spreading, when it has not spread much, the, our Prime Minister took a very wise decision, very quick decision, that uh, we will have a lockout. But the lockout period was, the time gap was very little because it was thought that if it spreads in a population of 1.3 billion of some of the very poorest population, there will be a problem. But one thing happened that uh, one events everything closed, some of the businesses, the building activities, the small businesses and other things closed and the people started moving back to their home. They started walking back to their home and then they carried this to the rural India. So although the infection was in the urban area and urban India in the initial stages and Kerala where the rural urban divide is not very well known, they problem arose uh, that uh, now the infection is in the rural area. The 52% more deaths are occurring in the rural area than in the urban area. This lockdown period was uh, actually uh, utilized to make more ventilators, to make more PPEs, masks, making people aware of the hand wash, mask and social distancing. Uh, all of these things were done and also building up the infrastructure. And uh, one of the things which, in which will be my main um, handle today, one of the things which was thought that we will have quick vaccine development. And um, our Prime Minister actually put a lot of effort on that. I will come to those efforts. And uh, desired that we should be able to make our own vaccines and should be able to deliver these vaccines to intended because you know that we know that diarrheal diseases are very nicely covered if we have a wash that is water hygiene and sanitation and others. But in a very poor population, it is very difficult to implement uh, that uh, when they have to go for their living. Social distancing becomes the least important part for them. Whatever you say, they are not able to do it. The same way the mask hands, hangs below the chin. They have a mask, but I don't know how long they were having that mask. But uh, it is very difficult. So vaccine becomes one of the major answer. And if we could do it and then we communicate well and um, improve the um, hygiene of the people in a country, where the, everyone doesn't have access to water and uh, there is a water shortage um, and we have the droughts and we have the floods. So in, in, those con in, in that kind of a country, the vaccine becomes a major answer. 
the rest are this of supportive public health measures <coughs> and we also started manufacturing the apis and the drug like we manufacture remdesivir um, Katsi, Gilead giving the open license the favipiravir and now monilopiravir which is one of the wonder drugs we are we are manufacturing it toxilumab of uh, the sibla actually uh, um, um, and some others to uh, they uh, brought in India the same way the um, uh, regeneron um, uh, two monoclonal antibodies have been are being distributed by Cipla. So all of these happened during those particular times. However, then we opened up. And when we opened up people who were bottled up in the house and they were uh, there were a lot of unemployment which happened, a lot of uh, loss of job which happened. People could, students couldn't go to school and colleges. And uh, work for home started, but then huge amount of job, job loss which happened uh, in India. And also there were salary cuts. All of our salary who we were working in the, who were working in the hospital, uh, there was cut in those. So, uh, during the first wave, we experienced another pang that is the um, crumbling of the health system. Like the hospitals were, were um, uh, preserved as a COVID uh, area. Uh, and uh, in the hospital, if you really want to make it function, every three days the patient should uh, circu uh, circulate. And the major surgeries and other interventions should be carried out. Uh, they they actually make the hospital survive and they should make 15 percent profit it didn't happen because covid patients remain for 10 15 days sometimes more and uh, the surgeries and everything stopped and all of these became a very important very difficult challenge for us however we opened up we were able to bring down the curve to appreciable uh, measure and we opened up, when, but then we opened up with vengeance and we thought that it is not going to come back. And by that time we had the vaccines and we have started vaccinating people also. So, uh, so some of the things happened which are inevitable our, uh, because the, uh, in America the election happened. So in India also some five states election happened. The, um, the Thanksgiving Day and all those things happen around the world. The Easter celebrations, the Christmas celebrations, you can't stop them. Like in India, Kumbh Mela happened and all those things happened and we had this second surge and we had this mutant. And it became very, very imperative at that time that uh, our health system entirely collapsed because uh, we suddenly felt shortage of oxygen because this time the infection was much more severe than the first round and uh, the oxygens were there but transporting the oxygen to the places became a problem because oxygens are um, have to be put in the iron cylinders you can't manufacture them so industrial oxygen we diverted to um, to uh, health um, care oxygen and we very quickly the Indian DRDO created aluminium cylinders so they were filled in aluminium cylinders the cryo containers were uh, were imported and many of the, our army planes were made into cryo container oxygen generators so the cryo containers passed from by aeroplane by by train or uh, by road and it became very very challenging so lot of oxygen machines were put up in the different part of the country and these oxygen machines uh, we now found that were very very important and the DRDO produced huge amount of oxygen concentrators so these concentrators were now produced and ventilators are produced by Indian industry a huge amount but it took some time now we have plenty we also learned to create large hospital settings by screw on technology so within within 15 days um, um, 20 days and a month we could erect large hospitals also so 
तो नाउ आई कम टू अवर मेन माय मेन स्टोरी फॉर नेक्स्ट टेन फिफ्टीन मिनट्स अबाउट द वैक्सीन एफर्ट विच वॉज विच विच आवर गवर्नमेंट हैंडल एंड हाउ इट हैंडल तो इन द वैक्सीन एफर्ट आवर आवर मेन आइडिया वॉज टू मेक वैक्सीन अवेलेबल तो वन ऑफ द थिंग्स विच इंडियन कंपनीज हैड they had a very large capacity for manufacture and had different kinds of platform like the novavax platform was already available with the cadilla in ahmedabad the tiram institute got into agreement with astrazeneca and started creating covishield much before the um, whole thing has um, established itself Uh, in india the the same way the uh, one of the platforms which uh, our which bharat 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 biotech had this platform was the, they had a cell cell line very nice certified cell line in which they had produced the rota rota virus vaccine and they then they produced uh, they grew the, they took a strain from the national institute of virology and they grew this uh, strain and they Created a killed vaccine. A similar vaccine was also developed in China. So, so this went with a quite a bit of speed. And then there were other agreements which uh, came into place, like uh, the um, Biological Ones uh, um, had an agreement with Baylor for an antigen-based vaccine, and uh, also with J and J to produce the J and J vaccine. the zydus cadilla had also an agreement and started doing it working on a dna vaccine a dna based vaccine and uh, the uh, same way the sputnik vaccine was made by reddy's lab is being made by reddy's lab and they imported the vaccine in between from the russia the, there is a company known as genova who created a messenger rna vaccine which they think they are better than pfizer and moderna they claim it now because they don't have to put it through that mixture which they do and their carrier is a lipid iron oxide and they had a they they uh, they manufacture their own adjuvant which is known as glass which they got from idri they are moving in a very good speed and will perhaps be available uh, quickly the same way there is a messenger rna agreement with a canadian company and an indian company and cipla is uh, negotiating with moderna to create another messenger rna vaccine so in this way we said we started creating through open licensing system and our own discoveries the vaccine things the other the next thing became the regulatory issue so we uh, there was a regulatory guideline by us fda but india needed vaccine quickly so it accepted the uh, astrazeneca large trials which happened around the world they took the uh, uh, looked at the data set and a small beijing trial was conducted by serum institute in india and this vaccine then was available very quickly it was the first vaccine available of uh, the indian regulators made it available to people and uh, and uh, the manufacturing had started much earlier so as soon as the regulators allowed it it was available to the people however in the co vaccine area which was done by bharat tech something was done and it was uh, taken into consideration of the realities of the situation there uh, it was allowed by looking at the um, looking at the up to phase 2 trial it hasn't conducted phase 3 trial it was allowed to go on a clinical trial mode so uh, the uh, the placebo group was not available but at that time the uh, one more thing happened that the infection rate came down in india so it was difficult to do in the real uh, mode of uh, action which uh, others uh, wanted to carry out uh, carry out like uh, these many infection should be there 
So the th phase three data is now available and will be unscrambled and perhaps will be used for uh, for uh, the uh, by the regulator. So these two vaccines were available very quickly. And India did the same thing as it happened in other places. It identified priorities, the healthcare workers, frontline workers, the and it chose the vaccinators from the hospital setting so that any SAE is uh, taken care of. And then it went to those above 65 and, com and 50 and comorbidities and then 45 and above. And now between 80 to 45, it did everything very nicely. It also exported the vaccine to some of the poor neighbors who didn't have access to vaccine. And because India couldn't really, although it was criticized, but uh, at that time, I think that was the right decision because you cannot uh, have something and deny your neighbors who are at one time were the same Indian subcontinent countries. Uh, the vaccine. So India willingly gave vaccine when no one in the world, like United States or Europe others, were given vaccines to anyone. Uh, um, but India was magnanimous enough. But then there were challenges. Our vaccination rate became very, very slow because, because our population is huge, 1.3 uh, billion population. And we needed to vaccinate about um, one third of the, of about uh, um, 50 to 60 percent of our population with two vaccines. In between, we started learning also. We learned that uh, two doses are necessary. If you use two doses, you can get up to 90 percent. But we, when we had vaccine shortages, we uh, took some new decisions that maybe you give the a COVID-shield vaccine after 12 weeks or maybe after three months. If you already had an infection, wait for three months and then take the vaccine. And we did a lot of uh, um, studies around vaccination to learn that there could be break, breakthrough infections in those who were vaccinated, particularly those who are single vaccinated. And But this will not be serious. Mostly it will not be serious. It will perhaps be uh, you will not have to go to hospital. But there were about five, nine, 90 doctors who died. They got very heavy infection while they were working because the air conditioning system and other systems are concentrated virus and they got a very concentrated virus dose, although they were vaccinated. So this was something which uh, was a very um, tardy. And then we were hit with mucormycosis because Suddenly, cortisone became a fashion, and this was perhaps the only drug which was given during, uh, which were to be given in the severe cases. And uh, there was no drug in the severe cases. Remdesivir has a very small window, and moruperavir and others were not available. Region known is now available, but that also in a very early window. So the, we were hit with mucormycosis. The vaccine was not a preventable thing there, and there was drug shortage. In between, when we hit the low level, the people started returning the remdesivir because um, uh, this was not used. And uh, companies stopped manufacturing. So when we were hit by the second wave, then they started manufacturing again. So now we have learned how to deal with the drug shortages. And now we do not have drug shortages. We have learned how to deal with oxygen. Now there is no shortage of oxygen. We have also learned to deal with how to put up mass bed facilities, oxygen bed facilities, and we have also learned how to enhance our ICU facilities. But in the vaccine arena, we are still learning. We are we are trying to learn whether we can mix vaccines. Suddenly, one vaccine is available in one area and is not available in other area. How do we do it? We had given. Uh, we had given uh, the different uh, uh, states a lot of power to import vaccine, but they were not able to import vaccines. So our prime minister said that 75% of the vaccine will be available to you free of cost, and 25% can be sold to private market by the vaccine companies who are craving for the price in which they are, which they are supplying. 
Uh, and uh, this is something which is very recent and which has been done to alleviate the uh, misery of the states. And the states are being provided now enough stock. But the main problem is to vaccinate the uh, remote uh, areas and the distant population. How to reach vaccinators there and do it. We had vaccinations for the primary uh, EPI vaccination things in the primary healthcare system, but we had never vaccinated the entire population, adult population. So that is something which we are struggling with. We have also started doing the Beijing studies in the in the uh, in the children from 12 to 18, and um, maybe we will be able to immunize the children also. I give one a few more last bites uh, into this that uh, we have uh, show we have uh, found vaccine hesitancy into particular in the rural population and uh, we have to deal with it and all kinds of rumors that that one of the vaccines has cow blood into this and all those kinds of things of um, rumors are starting and it is a, it is a very formidable thing to really work with the appropriate communication strategies and advocacy strategies to reach them and reach them and reassure them. We have now done because the COVID app, there was a digital divide in India and many people couldn't access that. And so the COVID app is now uh, not necessary. You can go and register, walk in and register and get vaccinated. So this is a new, new, uh, new um, a new uh, policy which is put in place. So policies are being tweaked. Policies are being uh, modeled around our need. Uh, at this given moment, what we are thinking that we will have uh, three or four or five choices. Uh, and if we get the Pfizer vaccine for which the negotiation and indemnity clause is being considered, if we get Pfizer vaccine, we will, uh, we will immunize uh, pregnant women with that because a lot of death in pregnant women and uh, then we will again be um, uh, reducing the thing. One, uh, one very major thing has happened that the, as you know, the counting of death is very difficult thing. The uh, COVID deaths, even after counting COVID deaths, the, the death in India, there has been a recent uh, study which a social organization did it. it. It noticed that in some of the states, the death rate has doubled between this time period. So that has happened because 90% of the time, um, uh, the uh, people with the cancer, people with the uh, acute cardiac events, people with the acute stroke and neurologic events, people with trauma and others, they uh, also died because the health system was full with the COVID subjects. And we are learning to cope with this. And future, we will have more infectious disease, hospital facilities, more facilities in the district level and other, other areas so that we will be able to deal with it. We also think that uh, we will we may have a third wave, uh, but uh, um, at this given moment, the policy is not, do not scare people with the uh, third wave, but prepare that we don't have to experience the third wave. So vaccinate. And our target is that we will vaccinate all the eligibles by December. Everyone wish us and pray for us that we are able to do it. And we have tried to enhance our vaccination rate. Uh, the material to make vaccine was not available from the US and Europe because there was a clamping down for those availabilities. They have been taken care of now and more and more vaccinators, NGOs, drive-in vaccination, many innovations have happened as we have learned from the world. And uh, we hope that we ramp up the diagnostics, we ramp up the staff, smart diagnostics, direct sputum test, one of the smell tests which, are, which can be done at the point of care. A lot of point of care tests have evolved and doing it smartly, ramping up our surveillance, ramping up our molecular surveillance and sequencing 
areas are some of the things where we have created consortium, we have created repositories, and we have funded our science organization and scientists with a lot of innovation. So whether these are diagnostics, whether these are drugs, whether these are vaccines, these innovations are happening in the research institutes and universities and, and appropriate uh, academic um, uh, and industry interactions and loan structure has been put in place. Uh, and just you have to hope that uh, we are able to come out of this. Uh, we are in the northern states. We are coming out of this. This, this is ebbing uh, in a very uh, speedy rate. The southern India is uh, dealing with it at this given moment. There also there is a downward trend, but it is still coping and dealing with it. There's, there's a smart lockdown is being practiced and hope that our economy will come back and we will be able to win this particular thing. India, Juvaru's country has been innovative country and has tried to do is much more luckier than others that it had vaccines, it had drugs, although there were shortages and was able to deal with such a huge population. And the second surge was something which was I have never seen in my entire life. And and uh, for my 55 years of career, I've never seen something like that in my life. And uh, but we, uh, although there were deaths, we were able to now deal with it. And probably, uh, but no complacency because till our population is not vaccinated, the masking, social distancing, putting money in the pocket of the people, providing them rations, providing them food, bringing the children back to school will be some of our priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganguly, for the illuminated COVID talk and a detailed overview on its origin, transmission, vaccination, and particularly thanks for highlighting the COVID management by India. Like you said, India has done really well considering the population, like considering the large population India has, and we believe we will fight through this. Thank you, Dr. Ganguly, again. Next up, we have a video message by a special guest, Professor Jerome Kim, who could not join us today. He's the Director General of International Vaccine Institute, South Korea, and is an international vaccine expert. Dr. Kim's work was among the first to demonstrate that an HIV vaccine could protect against infection. Dr. Kim is recipient of prestigious award, presti prestigious John Mayer Award for Research Excellence. Can you please play his video message now? Ambassador Ranganathan, Professors Ganguly and Pat, colleagues and students, it is my pleasure to take part in this inaugural event recognizing distinguished Indian heroes of science and technology on the occasion of 75 years of Indian independence. I thank the Indian students and researchers in Korea Association for inviting me today, and I congratulate you for all your efforts to expand and strengthen the Indian research community in South Korea. The contributions and achievements of Indian scientists, particularly in infectious diseases research, vaccine development and manufacturing, and health technology, have of course been invaluable to the work we do at the International Vaccine Institute, as well as for global public health. For those who may be less familiar, IVI is an international organization headquartered in Seoul, South Korea, established as an initiative of the UNDP and now operating independently with 36 countries and WHO as state parties. Four of those members contribute core funding to support IVI, including India and the Republic of Korea, Sweden, and Finland helping us achieve our mission to discover, develop, and deliver safe, effective, and affordable vaccines for global health and further the UN's sustainable development goals. IVI focuses on vaccines that protect against infectious diseases that predominantly affect low and middle income countries while placing an emphasis on building local capacity and transferring technology and technical know-how. Our work to make vaccines more widely available to the communities that need them most is enabled by supporters like the Indian government as well as research collaborators like ICMR and the National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases, or NICID. 
In fact, ICMR's Director General, Professor Balram Varga, has been a member of IVI's Board of Trustees for the past three years and has recently been reappointed to a second term, continuing to provide exceptional insight and guidance to IVI's leadership. In addition to close partnerships with the government, the public sector, and academic institutions, IVI work, works closely with industry partners such, such as Bharat Biotech and Shanta Biotechnics, now a part of Sanofi Pasteur. One of IVI's most successful product development partnerships was with Shanta, the first company to license and produce IVI's low-cost oral cholera vaccine. Following technology transfer to Shanta, IVI worked with Shanta and other partners to conduct safety and efficacy clinical trials of the vaccine in Kolkata. This vaccine was licensed in India as Shankal in 2009 and pre-qualified by the WHO in 2011, a major and critically needed achievement for global health. Shanta continues to manufacture Shankal in India, utilizing the technology transferred by IVI, contributing to the global stockpile of oral cholera vaccine managed by the World Health Organization. To date, more than 10 million doses of Shankal have been deployed worldwide in epidemic and endemic settings, and the use of OCV is considered one of the key tools of the WHO strategy to reduce cholera deaths by 90% by 2030. The contribution of Indian researchers and scientists to vaccine development and manufacturing are unparalleled. The Serum Institute of India, for instance, is the largest vaccine producing company in the world, making vaccines against measles, tetanus, diphtheria, hepatitis, and many other diseases, including COVID-19. In fact, nearly 70% of the vaccines used around the world for extended programs of immunization are manufactured in India, meaning that almost every child has received a vaccine made in India. And I'm confident that the next generation of Indian researchers, scientists, educators, and technicians will continue to build India's innovative vaccine industry and make an even greater impact on global public health. I particularly want to thank Ambassador Ranganathan for her steadfast support of IVI and send my regards and appreciation to Professor Ganguly, who was a member of IVI's scientific advisory group from 2016 to 2018 and previously held committee positions for IVI's cholera, cholera vaccine initiative and cholera vaccine investment case analysis. And on a personal note, would like to thank him for his advocacy and support for HIV vaccine development in India, as well as his encouragement mentorship and advocacy for a safe and efficacious vaccine against the group A streptococcus. I'm grateful to be in their company again today, along with Professor Harish Pat, and thank the Indian students and researchers in Korea Association for having me. In recognizing 75 years of Indian scientific achievement, there is much to celebrate, and IVI looks forward to another 75 years of collaboration and making global public health impact together. Thank you very much. ISRK would like to thank Dr. Kim for his video message and kind words. It's great to know the contributions of Indian organizations in the field of vaccine. I truly feel proud as an Indian. Next up, with special excitement, I am pleased to welcome our next speaker today, Professor Harish Pad. An eminent cell and molecular biologist, Professor Harish Pat is currently the Vice Chancellor of Vanita Vishram Women's University, India, and a former Vice Chancellor of renowned Sardar Patel University, India. With his academic career spanning from India to US, Professor Pat has over 200 publications to his credit. Right from its inception, Professor Pat has been highly supportive of this event. Honored to have you with us, sir. Over to you. Well, uh... Thank you, Apurva. Uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Shripriya Ranganathan, Professor Ganguly, uh, Professor Kim, fellow scientists and researchers, ladies and gentlemen. The event today is to celebrate 75 years of India's achievement in science and technology. To understand what has been achieved, what I'll do is I'll spend some time uh, in highlighting the achievement. And at the end, I would also set a goal for next 25 years so that when we are ready to celebrate century, 
of Indian independence. Some of the things that could have been done has not been done uh, would be taken care of by younger generations uh, like you all. So to understand what has been done in 75 years, uh, you have to flash back the kind of life that was there in after independence in the decades of 1950s and 1960s. Perhaps uh, of the people in this room, uh, nobody would know uh, the kind, the situation that existed uh, just after the independence. There were frequent famines. Every uh, other year, there will be a major famine. There was hardly any infrastructure, whether industrial or transportations. There is no significant manufacturing base in India. There were no foreign exchange reserve uh, India at that point in time for several decades. We were importing almost everything, food, medicine, and almost everything was imported. And when you don't have foreign reserve, foreign exchange reserve, you cannot even import much. There was rationing. Uh, ration card was re actually created for that purpose, that there was rationing of almost every food item and almost every other things. Uh, just to give you an example, we I remember uh, there were about 200 gram of sugar per person per month. That is what we used to get in the ration card. And uh, um, people of my generations uh, have taken tea with jaggery because sugar was not available. We have grown drinking the milk which was made out of the powder and the wheat which was donated by USA as a part of PL 480 grant. Professor Ganguly, if he's around, he would know uh, uh, these things. Ice cream was a once a year uh, treat. And that ice cream we used to make on a summer afternoon uh, by hand machines. And uh, that was the treat once a year we uh, did in our childhood. You may not realize uh, how difficult the time was. Uh, the foreign exchange, when I went to USA first time in 1978, the government gave me foreign exchange of $7. And at that time, the rate was seven rupees a dollar. So about 50 rupees conversion I could get from Reserve Bank to go to US, seven dollars. See, that's how things have changed. And other difficulties, at the, some point in time, the income tax brackets, the highest was 90%. 90% income tax bracket. So if you earn 100 rupees, pay 90 rupees as income tax. Why I'm dwelling on this thing is that young people may not realize uh, what, how the things were when we became independent. So in spite of these difficulties, you must appreciate the wisdom of the founders that they looked at long term and they set up a number of science and technology based institutions, TSIR, TST, ICMR, ICAR and uh, many others, IITs, uh, etc. Their emphasis was on infrastructure and particularly heavy industries uh, so that the basic uh, foundation can be built for the uh, later growth of the manufacturing base. And we also had a number of PSUs, public sector understand, uh, undertaking. Now, PSUs were, were doing many things uh, which was kind of in a uh, business domain, but government had to do because nobody had uh, nobody had that much of capital or we didn't have expertise to do that. Although now we are getting rid of. So under these circumstances, the long term vision of founders really led to the green <clears throat> revolution we had in 70s from net importer. We became net exporters of food grains, food items. Then, as it was mentioned earlier, we had a white revolution, milk related milk products, and followed by many. So, what I want to 
<clears throat> do is uh, I just want to may, uh, mention few sectors where India has done tremendously well and why I'm doing this thing uh, so that we can al analyze why India could do very good in those sectors and uh, why some other sectors were not, um, uh, we couldn't do as much. The one sector where India has done very well is uh, space science. Uh, we are very competitive with the rest of the world, with the developed uh, countries and uh, ISRO and related institutions have made India very proud uh, in the space science. Incidentally, this technology was all indigenously developed for space science. Uh, people like Vikram Sarabhai, uh, Homi Bhava, uh, they were the founders who really saw this in the 60s, 50s and 60s and developed uh, our um, space uh, research center and space science technologies uh, with ISRO and many other institutes uh, related to that. The other place where we have done very well is atomic science. Our nuclear explosion in uh, the time of first, in the time of uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, and subsequently in the time of uh, uh, Sri Vajpayee. Uh, these were really remarkable. And something <clears throat> very unique about these two sectors, the space science and atomic science, is that these were out of the domain of, uh, out of the sight of a common men, and therefore it was not really visible to media, it was not visible to politicians, and these sectors did very well on their own. The science in the name of confidentiality, uh, scientists were left on their own, and government led them to do the good science, and that resulted in the really good development of these two sectors. So it is, Government scientists had really remarkable achievement in this one. Uh, uh, other one sector I want to mention where the government worked only as a facilitators. And that sector is a pharma sector or chemical and pharma pharmaceutical sectors. <clears throat> when we became independent, uh, when we got independence, uh, India was net importer of most of the medicine most of the medicine and the few simple medications that Indian manufacturers made <coughs> uh, our doctors didn't have much faith in them and they, uh, that's why um, we were totally dependent on what we got from outside. Today uh, Indian pharmaceutical sector really exports medicines to all of the um, most of the major countries of the world including developed countries, including USA, including European countries. So pharmaceutical sector has really done remarkable. And one reason for that thing was government's facilitations that in 1970, uh, government changed the patent law to process patent. And that was one single reason. The Indian small scale sectors, Rainbexy, Lupin, Cadilla, they were all uh, in a small scale industry, they became multinationals because of that one law in the patent regime. And now <clears throat> they are very good in supplying quality drugs at really affordable prices to the rest of the world. So we are world's pharmacy. Similarly, India provides 60% of vaccines to the world. And I'm talking about pre COVID. In pre COVID, First, children through UNESCO, uh, they get 60% six, uh, of that vaccines are provided by Indian companies. So these were remarkable uh, <coughs> sectors where government worked as facilitators and uh, industry on their own. The entrepreneurial spirit of Indian people uh, really made the difference. And likewise, there are many other sectors that we can mention about India's achievement. One offshoot uh, is the education sector. You know, many CSIR and other institutions uh, train the workforce, the human resource in science and technology, IITs, uh, Indian Institute of Science, and many of them. So they train the young people like us 
uh, to and made them competent scientists and technologists that you can see any country the research science and technology uh, are populated by tra people trained in india whether it is google whether it's ibm whether it is uh, any other sectors the most of the scientific manpower technology manpower is provided by indians and that was a really uh, remarkable offshoot of the uh, earlier <coughs> investment in setting up uh, industries uh, setting up the research institutions by government now let me take a couple of minutes to say where and why we couldn't do well because if you really want to take stock uh, as a scientist you have to uh, examine both the angle you have to see the achievement but also you have to see uh, what more could have been done and set them as a goal for the uh, future one thing india is not that good is in precision manufacturing where you require a very precision manufacturing you know for example microprocessors silicon based microprocessors india even a small country like taiwan uh, has a really tremendous capabilities uh, and we uh, have uh, not been able to make our dent although we claim in computer science we are very good but that's a software part of it uh, the hardware part and the manufacturing of a very precision scale uh, somehow india has not done very well one possibility is that india the <clears throat> in academic and industrial collaborations uh, is not as good as it could be as it should be and that uh, really requires because these are two different cultures and that requires to uh, come together somehow we have not uh, been able to do well uh, I, I i have i'm emphasizing this because my hope is on you all the next generation uh, who should do it what we our generation could not possibly do so a good academic and industrial collaboration is something that we should uh, think about and develop it so that these deficiencies would not last for too long in our system. Our industry, most of them uh, doesn't have an R&D culture uh, for whatever reasons. Uh, and that, uh, if you see a good industry, a good company, uh, it has a lot of R&D investment. Our companies uh, are not that good uh, give you a pharma example uh, most of the R&D is to make a ANDA that is abbreviated new drug applications uh, so that is really a, like making generic not really R&D of finding new drugs or finding new formulation it is just to be able to register your preparation in USA or developed countries so we need a R&D culture in our industry and we need an integrated cohesive approach which sometime um, uh, you know the different parts the different us uh, different uh, branches of government do not know what has been happening uh, sometimes the integrations with the stakeholder uh, is not as good as it should be so uh, these are a couple of things that we should keep in mind when we plan for uh, next 25 years. Finally, I want to say that what does science give us? Science gives us two things. One, science gives us technology, and through technology, we get products. And uh, it happened about 25 years back. I was invited to speak at the Golden Jubilee of India's independence. Today, we are thinking about 75 years when it was, uh, I think, in uh, 97. Uh, I was a speaker and I was, about, I was asked to talk about India's achievement in science and technology. So I had said at that time, and what is very true today, that science gives us two things. One thing is uh, technology products, which we are very good at. It. You know, we, many of us have a very sophisticated telephone that we hardly know how to use every feature of this one. Uh, so that's a one output of science. 
but the important other aspect that science gives us which we as indian uh, have not imbibed very well is a scientific temperament and uh, what we need to learn from science we of course we can use all the products that science technology give us but what we really need to learn from science is to develop a scientific temperament as an individual as a society as a government as a institutions that scientific temperament if we are able to imbibe and what that means is the rational analysis and a logical uh, decision making so rational decision making that the science have taught us in the laboratory if we use that in our individual life in our uh, public life uh, i think most of half of our problems will disappear so the real challenge for india uh, when we take a stock of science and technology achievement the real challenge for india is uh, how to imbibe the scientific temperament in our uh, public culture and if we can do that uh, i think uh, uh, we will uh, stand apart from all other countries and we will do wonderfully well uh, finally i want to thank the organizers for having me here it has been a, uh, it has been a really pleasure to see uh, people from south korea uh, our scientists uh, from south korea and uh, thank you very much professor pad i would particularly like to mention this that very few times the host is at loss of words because of because the speaker has spoken so well and i'm experiencing that moment now because of your well structured talk thank you right, thank you right from beginning where you mention about the independence time how india used to import wheat we have come a long way from importing wheat to producing wheat now and uh, See, i i mention it because I, i mention it because i'm sure people of your generation would not know this it true true enough and also highlighting on what we had what we should do and how we should do uh, we i mean please accept my humble thanks for for an for an illuminative talk and like you said the previous generation has sown the seeds it's upon us on how we nurture the plant and we really hope that we can make you all proud thank you sir thank you uh next we have this platform open for an interact interaction session so if anyone has any questions please type in in the q and a box and i will be asking the questions to professor pat uh i think we have one question and the question is in villages people are not interested in vaccination and roaming around without mask and social distancing will it cause the next phase of corona soon uh i don't know will it uh, i am uh, this is a question for professor ganguly uh, but uh, since you are asking me uh, i am not sure whether that will cause the third wave uh, but we should not be surprised if it leads to the third wave uh, i think we all need to do few simple things a few simple things uh, that can uh, that can prevent uh, such uh, spread of a very uh, very uh, pandemic virus and uh, you know the rules are very simple wearing a mask uh, i don't know why people find it very uh, inconvenient i have seen people who wear the mask but if they have to talk on phone they remove the mask and the mask will be hanging is uh, somewhere here uh, i think it's not necessary i have talked uh, with mask on telephone uh, there is no difference and so people should wear the mask keep a distance and don't uh, don't uh, have a uh, gathering i think professor ganguly is here so he can elaborate on this one uh, i just repeat the question yeah i'll just yeah, i'll just repeat yeah. the question to dr ganguly okay, okay. Uh, so there is a question from hemra chippa and he asks in village people are not interested in vaccination and are roaming around without mask and social distancing will it cause the next phase of corona soon actually uh, if we are not careful and we don't take the basic 
because our population is not vaccinated enough. At the moment, only 10% or 9% population has got double vaccine, and we have to reach 60-70%. So then we can't really stop any public health measures. We need to do door-to-door, door-to-door uh, campaigning in the uh, for with the diagnostics, with the surveillance, and door-to-door -door vaccination in the villages. And we will have to put money in the pocket of the poor because they are uh, they. If they, if you don't have bread, if you have nothing to eat, you can't ask them that you wear mask and we uh, uh, and do this and do that. So that is not their priority. Their priority is putting bread on the, for the children and themselves. So we need to do something which Mr. Modi ji is now doing that providing food to the people. And that we need to make it efficient because if it is not efficient, it doesn't reach to people, it reach other persons. So one World Bank uh, analysis showed that, uh, that the goods meant for uh, lowest 10 percent, 20 percent quartile are taken up by the more affluent people. Like in the vaccination, although it was also meant for poor, those who were more digital savvy, who were more influential, they got the vaccination, you know, first, because they could access the vaccination. The distant, the poor, they couldn't access this, uh, this easily. They, they didn't know how to log in into this, that app and go. And uh, they couldn't run from uh, post to post and lose their day's wages to get vaccinated. So the vaccination need to reach the doorsteps. It needs to at least within two kilometers of the person so that the person could get vaccinated. But essentially we need to provide food and job. If we can provide food and job, the, uh, the population will be more willing to observe more rules and, uh, and uh, get vaccinated. If we also mobilize the communities, the communities with whom, uh, to whom they can trust, they may not trust us and they may think that we are doing something, uh, some research on them or some bad thing to them, but uh, they need they will trust their own people, their own communities. So we need to mobilize the communities to really deal with them, involve more NGOs, involve their own peers, their own people from the villages who should be the messenger. And uh, that, that will be the answer. But I agree with you if the rural and peri-urban and, uh, and the much more worse is the ur uh, urban poor, they are in the slums, they are on the street, they are sleeping on the street, and they don't exist in any health system. Um, those slums are not in our map. So we need to really take care of them. Then we will be winner. Thank you, Dr. Ganguly, for your answer. Uh, do we have any other technical questions for doc Dr. Ganguly or Dr. Pat? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, Prua, please go uh, ahead about Dr. Hiralal. I have asked the questions to about the person, how to propagate the industry, academia, collaborations, robust in the present scenario, how to work robustly to yield good uh, results in future to person. Actually, if you ask me, the India has a few major programs for India academic collaboration and also industry academic collaboration and also moving the industry, supporting the industry. These are the BIRAC, SIBRI, TDB. So these are the programs specifically for academic industry collaboration, even for manufacturing. It is not only for research or innovation, it is for manufacturing, also for clinical development. The, we have Nimit leave in the CSIR. So we have several such programs. We also have a program for young entrepreneurs. We have now Angel Fund for women entrepreneurs. So these are some of the things that are there, but which are not there and we need to put in. We need to allow the uh, 
same model as Sweden and other places where the university professors, university lecturers could open up their own companies and could really foster this and ultimately uh, link up with the bigger companies with their innovation. So this is something which should be done much more efficiently in India. It, it exists in paper, but it is not very powerful. Indian Institute of Science, etc. There are some scientists in the CCAM, some scientists do that, but it is not very widely prevalent. The second thing is to we need to, when we opened up research institutes, some of the universities were weakened. We need to really strengthen our universities and, and give them a lot more funds for uh, such things. And we also need to really involve the Baydol, Baydol Act, which is there in the States, which puts money into the pocket of the innovator and, uh, and uh, makes them share the profits. So these are some of the things which we need to do. A lot of things are in the place and a lot of things have to be put in place. Thank you, sir, for highlighting the do's. Uh, our next question is from Pankaj K. Gupta, and uh, his question is to prof uh, his his question is for Professor Pad, and he had, and he asks, without any action on brain and brain drain, India will be able to make it possible to improve R and D. Your suggestions to brain to stop brain drain at hundred. Uh, you know, when I was uh, I, I was doing my PhD, uh, the issue of brain drain was a uh, very uh, very prominent. Uh, people were saying that this doctors and engineers and scientists, we are training and they are going and serving in the foreign countries. Now, we don't hear that much because we have enough of brain uh, trained uh, and much of it is in India and some have gone abroad. And that brain drain has become a brain bank. So those are the fertile brains uh, abroad, like you people, and uh, directly, indirectly, you are your or your expertise is always available uh, to India. Uh, so as I said earlier, we did a good training of uh, scientists uh, in our institutions, and some of them who are abroad, we don't consider that we have lost them. Uh, we, they are our reserve. And some of them who are in the country are really uh, working. And uh, I don't really see an issue of brain drain now. Uh, what we need is a good ecosystem where industry, academia, and the government uh, have a very cohesive and integrated approach to problem solving. Like what Professor Ganguly mentioned in case of uh, COVID vaccine, uh, I think they all work together in a timely fashion. Uh, uh, and uh, likewise, if we do that, that kind of a, a collaborative and integrated approach um, is, is good enough. I mean, we have enough brain now, and we count you all as a bank, brain bank. <laughs> yeah, I hope that happens soon, sir. Uh, our next question. I don't think is related to this, but but I will just ask: Why is India lagging in happiness index? You you are asking to whom? To both of you. Actually, nobody should ever be happy. Totally, happiness means death. So always be unhappy if you really want to strive forward. <laughs> but that is. That is for the that is for the scientists and the others because because uh, but the happiness index uh, is somewhere where we have lost our way in the work culture. We uh, work very long hours. Where we have very little time for family. When these long hours are never worked by anyone in the world. And from the early in the morning, late in the night, we work on the Saturdays. We work on the Sundays. So very little time for the family and other activities. This need to change. Uh, like if you want to take any appointment or any event on Saturday, Sunday, anywhere in the world except the Asian countries, they are uh, you are not going to get that uh, slot. 
and at five o'clock, uh, normally, uh, not in the Asian countries, but in all other countries, uh, the clock stops. You go home and and uh, be with your family. That brings in the happiness. The second thing, which is the social changes which are happening in India, that uh, I used to be. Uh, in my childhood was spent into a family where there were 200 people living in a single house, huge house, five-acre land house, but for 200 people were in la an army of children, adolescents, older older people, and it used to be a dream living. Now, with just a, a unitary family with no parents, no grandparents, uh, the children are uh, with one child mostly. Uh, the whole thing is changing. The whole social fabrics and other things are changing. We need to uh, change our work culture. We need to be more with the family, and we need to work more targeted in a more targeted way, rather than um, um, in the daytime you do numerous meetings, unnecessary meetings, and then start working from the evening. It doesn't really work. So we need to learn something from the Western cultures and evolve our own culture of peace, meditation, yoga, and and the family values, nurture family values. That will bring in the happiness. But for the scientist, if you become happy, you are gone. You are dead. Because then you don't uh, really push yourself to achieve more. So never be happy. So the synopsis to the uh, question. Sorry. Yeah, yes, Shall yes, I add? Huh? yes, yes, sure. Uh, you know, the happiness index uh, is developed uh, by Western uh, way, or, and it's a very complicated formula. I have looked into it. What it includes is, uh, for example, per capita GDP, what it includes is the health infrastructure, what it includes is the social welfare programs by the government, what it includes is the uh, ease of doing business. It includes um, how easily the justice is served or not served. And so there are many complicated factors that go into developing the happiness uh, index. I sometimes doubt whether it really reflects the happiness uh, of a people. Uh, it does reflect a, a well-being of people, but happiness is a different uh, a different parameter that uh, we have to look. So, in short, it's a very complicated formula, and many of the other government programs and all go into determining that. Thank you, both of you, for illuminate for talking about the happiness index. Uh, next up, I have a personal question to ask to both of you as a scientist. Uh, where do you think we could have improved in the COVID situation, or do you think we could have improved? in some way in the COVID situation. I personally feel India has done well considering the population, but are there any uh, ifs that we could have done to curb the deaths? I can do this, that uh, the government never does anything well anywhere in the world. So mm -hmm. you know, we need to, we need to um, depend on people more people outside the government so that they uh, and uh, then created policy groups who could really look at the data create large data cruncher large, large data aggregators large data repositories open them up for analysis to scientific community look at those analysis look at those modelings look at those forecastings as well as look at the opinion and then create policies which are much more uh, independent and not yes sir cultures. Because if somebody very senior in the government is uh, giving an opinion, all the other people sitting around the table say yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. And that policy is never a very true policy. The second is that uh, free exchange of opinion aware uh, and policies and uh, let um, the thousand flowers bloom let let anybody with any good idea who wants to convert it give that person a chance to convert that idea into action 
that will actually bring in and finally the communities are your god they they are the people who have uh, put you in their schools and colleges they have put you uh, given you your jobs they have given you everything and you need to really connect with them you need to know what they want i will give you one small story i was doing in when i was teaching in pj chandigarh i was doing a very um, good uh, project on rheumatoid rheumatic heart disease and we thought that so it was in about uh, um, the population of about uh, more than one and a half million so after we completed the project very happily i asked the people that how do you feel about this project they said well uh, it was okay but our problem is tuberculosis so so since you didn't wanted to know what really community needs it becomes a problem i was very fond of my car my wife hated it the day i left chandigarh came to delhi she sold it the next day because she didn't like it so whatever you are doing for people people should get involved there should there should be a demand from them for that particular product and if they get involved if they know that it is for their own good they will participate and you will be successful thank you dr ganguly uh, dr pad would you like to add something yes yes uh, i think there are something that we could have done one uh, the population the people uh could have uh, followed the basic rules uh, uh, more rigorously and that would have really eliminated much of the uh, casualty that you mentioned second thing uh, we had elections and elections in five states and uh, also some local elections in up uh, and uh, they became a super spreader because uh, you can see uh, thousands of people without any social distance without any mask and government should not have let it happen if you have to do elections at least do it with rules that was not there and similarly kumbh mela and uh, many other such uh, gatherings either social or religious um but it could have been avoided and uh, if we did that i think uh, we would have been in better uh, numbers right please sir thank you um there are actually a lot many questions but we are running short of time so probably we will take in in our next sessions and moving on so uh, i now invite the man behind isrk dr lalesh kumar president of isrk to take over and propose the vote of thanks yeah thank you purva ji for your kind introductions <coughs> namaste everyone on behalf of indian students and researchers in korea isrk associations i would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the indian ambassador to the republic of korea h e sri priya rangnathan ma'am for a valuable time and his speech it is indeed an honor and sincere pleasure to have you amid such despite your busy schedule thank you so much ma'am once again for always providing support to indian student and researcher as well as other indians in republic of korea in all circumstances and we also got the very good idea to collaborate with india in Co uh, korea institute with mu we are looking forward in future we are also very thankful to professor n k gangli sir padma bhushan awardi in medicine one of the legends in science and technology for his mesmerizing talk and intellectual interactions sir your keynote on covid 19 management by india and given overall view of present situations are really commanding and helpful to all the participants to know in detail by all the covid situations in india we believe that your talk and interactions will empower young student researcher and scientist to pursue their research with zeal and enthusiasm we are also very thankful to professor jerome kim 
Director General of IVI International Vaccine Institute for his valuable video message due to his busy schedule regarding the contributions of Indian scientists in the field of vaccine as well as looking forward to collaborate with Indian researcher with IVI. ISRK is also deeply grateful to Professor Harishwal for his nice uh, lecture and interactions from independence to 75 years, who is also former vice chancellor of Sardar Patel University for supporting us as well as guiding us from time to time since the conceptualization of this event. Thank you, sir, for steadying our mind with your valuable thoughts. Also, I would like to thank Sir C. V. Raman for paving way to Indian scientists and making all of us, especially the young mind of the country, believe that if we dream, we can achieve it. So always dream it and try to achieve it. I am also very grateful to Dr. Bihu Jain, Chairman of Advisory Board of ISRK, for his tremendous support at every step while building ISRK as well as for being a strong pillar in the determining, demanding its situations. This event would not be possible without his idea and support. We are also deeply thankful to the Merck Life Sciences India for providing us this platform to host this event and also prom promoting it throughout the world. We are also grateful to to the entire team of Mark Life Science India for their unconditional support, especially thanks to Dr. Pankal, Pankal Joshi, Dr. Ankul, Dr. Paulji, and others from the Mark Life Science India. We look forward to having collaboration with you for future events. We would also like to appreciate the support provided by Mr. Sanjeev Varhoja, editor of Asiana Community News, Asian Community News, and also Mr. Joe editor of Seoul Times for providing their support as well as sharing and publicizing this event in their newspapers. We are also thankful to all the Indian community leaders in Korea as well as for different country for providing their support as well as sharing and publicizing this event in their community. Due to huge support from Indian community as well as different institute and labs, more than 100 participants have been joining us today event. My vote of thanks will not be completed without the special mention of our Vice President of ISRK, Dr. Iqbal Kaji. He is the man who made this event and does everything in his will to reach out and promote the event. Thank you, Iqbal. I also would like to thank Apurva Kulkarni for being the face of today's event and her continuous support to the ISRK. Also, I would like to extend my appreciations to the other ISRK team members, especially Palak, Manas, Saifuddin, Sikha, Prasant, Ritu, Nutan, Bipin, Bikrant, Vidisa, Tanvista, Gitika, Namneet, Dilip, Santhil, and all the ISRK representative members. We have 100 uh, ISRK uh, representative members in our group. So they have played an important role by dedicating their time and effort in spite of the ongoing busy schedule in Korea. A special thanks to Siwani Purwar, Art in Pixel company for designing the event poster as well as kind support. It is indeed ISRK privilege to showcase achievements and contribution of Indian scientists in the field of science, engineering, and technology for infographics, videos, every week and selected interactive sessions for 75 weeks from now on. Humble request to everyone, please join us again or watch out for the legends of science and technology on ISRK social media, Facebook, Twitter, ISRK website and LinkedIn. We will share infographics every week on this platform. <laughs> Let us all together learn and create awareness of Indian scientists far and wide. Once again, thank you all the participants. Thank you everyone for joining us today and making this event as a grand success. Please be stay safe, stay at home, as well as please use all the precautions 
एंड बी पॉजिटिव इन द टफ सिचुएशन नमस्ते एवरीवन वंदे मातरम जय हिंद नाउ आई ओवर टू अपूर्वा वेल डॉक्टर गांगुली एंड डॉक्टर पद एंड डियर ऑडियंस दिस रैप्स अप आवर सेशन टुडे बट डू नॉट फॉरगेट टू जॉइन अस एवरी वीक फ्रॉम नाउ ऑन अंडर 75 वीक्स on a scientific exploration to learn more about indian science and the indian scientists on behalf of isrk i would like to express my deepest gratitude to you all for making the event a successful event and also for taking out time in your busy schedules to join us it has been an absolute pleasure to host this event i wish you all a great rest of the week and happy 75th independence day in advance remember we are not hindus neither muslims not christians we are indians first jai hind jai bharat dhanyawad